chapter 10. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 10 to 12. Years ago, Janella and I were driving through Palm Springs in the middle of a howling sandstorm and rocks were hitting the car. And if you live in Port Townsend, that might not be an image that you relate to very well. But think about that image as I read these verses. Deuteronomy 32, verses 10 to 12. In a desert land, he found him. In a barren and howling waste, he shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. So, have you ever thought about what your angel looks like? Um, several years ago, I read Frank Peretti's This Present Darkness. And um, I remember how he described the angels that were battling, doing the spiritual warfare in that book. And they were big and strong. And um, I now can visualize my angel, especially when I'm afraid, standing over me with a beautiful smile and spreading his huge wings and flexing his muscles. I mean, I just imagine. And I also know that my angel can call for reinforcements of 10,000 more, just like him, if I need help. If we just could visualize some of these things, it would give us peace when we're in times of trial and trouble. I am completely safe, and nothing touches me without God's permission. I just want you to think about that. When we lived in Brunswick, two ambitious laymen from our church came proposing that they plan a Christmas pageant. And this Christmas pageant that they wanted to create was of monumental proportion. Very, very ambitious, with exquisite costuming and set design and special lighting and a whole new set of microphones, ear mics, and the whole bit. And these two men worked on it year round. And we've been here seven years. They're still working on it, perfecting, perfecting, perfecting it. And the first year we did, no, the second year we did it, we had to have, to have to fill the church five times because the people in the community liked it so much. And we would be giving away tickets, and it was just amazing. Well, one of the scenes that they envisioned and had enacted in this pageant was the woman who played Mary sang Breath of Heaven. And they had all kinds of angels with wings that actually had all of the feathers individually sewn on them. My, my daughter was one of the angels, and I was just amazed at the, at the work that it had take, taken to create those wings. And these angels came around her as she finished singing Breath of Heaven. And there, there were probably like six of, six of these young women with their angel costumes. And they just folded their wings over her. And at that particular time, I was pastoring a neighboring church, which was in horrible conflict. And just seeing those wings over Mary saying, give me strength, help me, is, is the words of that Breath of Heaven song. Help me, help me, help me. And how the angels came in answer to that prayer was so comforting to me that those angels would also be over me as I tried to lead a church that was in conflict. And it was just, it was just a really encouraging, heartwarming 
experience to see it and to envision that now for myself. So I looked up the words to Breath of Heaven and I wrote them in my journal. And then I also opened my concordance and looked up the word wings. Okay, so we're going to talk about wings today. Um, I learned that there's something bigger and stronger and wider than angels' wings. God has wings. It's a metaphor, so you can't stretch it too far. But the Bible tells us in many places that he has wings. So we're going to start with Psalm 91, verse 4, where it tells us, He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Now, I love this metaphor because it describes not only safety like a castle, but it describes intimacy, that God brings us so close that we can feel his heartbeat when we're in trouble, that he, he brings us near to himself and he is personally involved in our protection. We are not left to defend ourselves it says his faithfulness is our shield. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. So you combine, combine strength with faithfulness, and you have the prerequisites for trust. And that trust is what we need. But it also says we can rest under the shadow of the Almighty. Abide. Rest near him. No matter where we are, we are only a shadow's distance from the presence of the everlasting God. Do you feel like you are living your life in God's shadow? And what would change in your life if you always imagined his shadow over you, his wing over you? So, verse 1 indicates that only a few humans, i got to go backwards, um, it says, he who dwells. So, so you have to choose to dwell. Only a few humans avail, them, avail themselves of the help that is constantly near. We must dwell or abide through faith in his shelter. We have to choose to tuck in and, to, and put ourselves so close. The word abide, what does it mean? Stay with, live with. The abode is the place where you live. It's where you go home, the place that is your default, where you spend your downtime. Okay. So if we abide in God's shadow, that means any moment that you're not otherwise occupied, you're putting yourself back there. You're focusing on the fact that his shadow is over you. Here's the question. Do your problems or God's faithfulness cast a larger shadow over your life? OK? And if your problems cast a larger shadow than God does, you need to move to get into his shadow. Put yourself there, and you that, do that intentionally through prayer and through looking at his character through the word. So, verse 2 gives us the first step. It says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and fortress, my God in whom I trust. So, it says to say this. You see that? I will say of the Lord. So I'm going to ask you to actually say it. You are my fortress, my refuge and fortress, my God in whom I trust. Is there ever a situation that those words would not apply? Is there ever a situation that those words would not help? 
especially when you're in trouble, those words would be amazing and helpful. So then it goes on. It says, he will deliver you from the fowler's snare. So that also could become an affirmation. You will deliver me from the fowler's snare. So say that with me. You will deliver me from the fowler's snare. Now, we don't live in Ukraine, so it's not going to be real bullets. But we have an enemy, and he has us in his crosshairs, and he's trying to ruin the peace and the effectiveness of our lives. And this is just an affirmation of confidence that God can protect you from the enemy. He will deliver me. Okay, this is a reality. Trust keeps us grounded, and fear makes us vulnerable. So do what we can to talk ourselves into trusting him. You are not dead meat. You are not. You're beloved, and surely God will save you. So, surely God will save me is something else you can say. And then it says, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. It says that God stretches out his wings and covers us. He personally is our shield between us and the enemy. But we have, we're only safe if we stay there. If we venture out into enemy territory and try to do our lives without being under the shadow of the Almighty, then we're vulnerable. If we stay tucked in, we're fine. But many times we do find ourselves vulnerable because we have not stayed where we need to be. So let's do an affirmation here. Under your wings, I will find refuge. Whoa, isn't that a beautiful prayer? Did you know you could do this with the Psalms? Not just this one, but all of them. You can turn into outlines for meaningful, deep prayer, much deeper than if you just reform it. Pray the word. Okay, so then let's look at a different psalm. Psalm 63, verse 6. It also talks about God's wings. It says, on my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Okay, if you are awake through the watches of the night, what's that indicating? Insomnia, okay? It's saying, I have insomnia, and when I have insomnia, I think about God, which is a pretty good idea. If you're not able to sleep, to use that time to focus on God. And he says, I remember you. Sleeplessness happens. And here is the next verse. It says, because you are my help, I sing under the shadow of your wings. So now, not only are you tucked in to, under God's wings, but you're singing with peace and joy. And the intimacy is going both directions. He is protecting you, and you are worshiping him. So when you have insomnia and you can't sleep, imagine his wings over you and start singing. Now, Mark is so deaf, he doesn't even hear me when I sing in bed. You know, only if I poke him does he even know I'm there. So I can sing in my bed and he doesn't even know. All right. So here is a strategy. In every situation, we can tuck in safely under God's wings, or we can leave ourselves out there by ourselves. We can sing for joy, or we can shake with fear. And which is God's will for his people? To sing for joy, not to shake with fear. OK, so let's look at how Jesus did this. In Luke 13, 31, it says, at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, 
Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. All right, this is like this idea that you are not welcome here, and by the way, you're on a hit list. And you just think, how would you like to have enemies that were just following you around saying these kind of things? Would that create a little bit of anxiety if people were saying these things aloud to you? But look at how Jesus responds to this in Luke 13, 32. He says, go and tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. So how did Jesus respond to threat and insult? He just stayed focused. He said, I know what I'm here to do, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to reach my goal. You're not going to deter me from doing what I need to do. In other words, Jesus was secure. He was so secure, and he was unable to be threatened because he spent so much time under his father's wings in prayer, night after night after night. He said, I am protected by someone more powerful than Herod basically, and I'm going to do my thing and not be deterred. And then the next verse is one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible. He says, How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So he's saying, I want to bring you to myself. I want to protect you. I want to have that intimacy with you. And you just refused it. Amazing, isn't it? That we have this kind of a God. We have this kind of a Savior. And we don't avail ourselves of that protection and of that peace that he would offer. Now, just in case you have the idea that staying under God's wings is a place of passivity, a place that you do nothing but play it safe, we have another verse to look at. Deuteronomy 32, verses 10 through 12, the passage that was read for our scripture. Let's first talk about the context that's um, outlined in chapter 31, verses 14 through 22. So God says to Moses, the day of your death is near. Call Joshua, bring him to the tent of meeting where I will commission him to take your place. So Moses and Joshua presented themselves to God. The Lord appeared in a tent in a pillar of cloud, and the cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. Then the Lord gave Moses some bad news. Not only is he going to die very soon, but he said the People of Israel are going to forsake God and break his covenant and end up in a, a world of hurt and a world of trouble. It will break God's heart. He will be forced to turn away his face. They will have many disasters and difficulties because they turn to other gods. Now, if you were Moses, how would you like that message? He loved those people. He had led those people for years. And now he has this prophecy that God is giving him that there is horrible stuff ahead for these people's history. Okay. When God finishes, God, it, verse 19 says, write down for yourself this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it. God wanted Moses to sing a song. And I think that probably God sung the song, sang the song to Moses. Wouldn't that be amazing to hear God himself sing a worship song, describing his faithfulness? So Rose, Moses wrote down the song, and he taught it to the Israelites. So this just fascinates me. Don't you wish? the music would have been recorded as well as the words. What do you think the melody sounded like? Was there rhythm? God gave Moses three sermons. He had them write them down for th word for word for the people for the future. 
and then he finished his three sermons with a song. He told the whole story of Israel again, reminded them of their mistakes and gave them warnings, and offered them hope that would only come through trust in God. All in an art form because music bypasses your frontal lobe and your defenses. And it can hit your heart in a way that just the spoken word can't. That music is so powerful. So God wanted his people to have these words in their memory and in their hearts. And so he put it to music. I wish that we could sing that worship song today. I wish we could hear God sing it. Maybe in heaven. It says in Zephaniah 3.17, that he sings over us. Wouldn't that be amazing to hear God singing? So, Moses recited the words of this song from beginning to end in the hearing of the whole <coughs> assembly of Israel. Now, what would it have felt like to be in the congregation that day and hear Moses singing? How would it have felt for Moses to be singing this song? The people were still so stubborn, so faithless, so unfinished. Their characters definitely had not yet been developed. Did this feel like a failure for Moses? You know, I live with a man who is so competent, and he often comes home saying he's a failure. And I just want to say, let God decide that. Let, let God decide if your performance is enough. It's not up to you to judge yourself. Did Moses' voice choke? Did tears come to his eyes and then fill his throat? Did he sing like an old man whose life work seemingly had come to nothing? Or did he sing with the true focus on God and what God could and would still do, even though the people had failed so desperately. So let's look at the words. In the desert land he found them. You could come up with a melody in your, in your mind if you want to. In a barren and howling waste, he shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. This is God talking of Israel guarded him as the apple of his eye. And that sounds a lot like Psalm 91. In verse 11, it takes protection to a whole new level. It says, as an eagle stirs up her nest and hovers over her young, who spreads her wings to catch them and carries them on her pinions. The four verbs in this verse, I want you to look at them so I have, I have capitalized them. The eagle stirs, hovers, catches them, and carries them. This is what God can do for us. Stir, hover, catch, and carry. What a metaphor. So let's start with the word stir by taking a moment to think about eagle's nests. Okay, do you see where this nest is? When that baby eagle needed to learn to fly, if the eaglet didn't get it right, how far would they fall? Long way down. So eagles notoriously build their nests in high places, on faces of cliffs, sometimes 8,000 feet high. Now, I watched cardinals teach their babies to fly out my bathroom window, about eight feet up. And none of them fell, and I was glad, but it wouldn't have been that far of a fall. But if you have a fall from that kind of height, if they can't get that flying thing down the first time, that's, that would be very problematic. When a baby eagle learns to fly, that first fall may be thousands of feet. OK, here's a picture of a place I hiked with my kids. This is Eagle's Landing in a Zion National Park. And um, we got halfway up this hike, and there was a little sign that said that 
several hikers a year die completing this hike because it's very dangerous. The cliffs are on both sides and you basically walk out that little promenade that sticks out there. Um, and Mark and my kids did it. I stayed at the halfway point and prayed for them because I had already fallen off the cliff at Shy Shy. So I had a little fear that would have made it a little more difficult for me. And I was thinking my kids might really hate hearing me say, be careful, be careful, be careful for the whole hike. All right. So think about the fact that eagles care for their young, and yet they raise their young in a dangerous, horrible, dangerous place. It makes me sympathize with, young, with mother eagles when I, we went on this hike to Angel's land, Landing. So with painstaking care, the eagles will build a nest that can weigh up to two tons and stretch as much as eight feet across. Limbs up to four inches in diameter are there to build the base of that net nest. The nest can be as deep as two feet. The core of the nest is supported by huge limbs and the outer edges of the nest are then lined with soft leaves and moss. All right, so that gives you an idea how big the nest is, right? The, the kid in it. The moss covers the rough sticks that would puncture the eggs and the soft fur of the eaglets. It's a playpen at 8,000 feet. And the mother and the father eagles stay close by, one guarding the nest while the other hunts or fishes to provide food for the rapidly growing babies. So when you think of eagles, you think of them being able to soar and that they're strong and that they're fierce. Do you ever think about the fact that they are very tender and attentive to their young? Is that what comes to mind when you think of eagles? But that's what the biologists tell us, is that eagles are amazing parents. Parent eagles invest in, nurture, and vigilantly watch over their young. During incubation, one parent remains at the nest at all times to keep the eggs warm, to protect them. The other parent hunts, and then they provide everything those babies need. This gives us a perfect illustration that God shields us, guards us, and cares for us. Okay, and then we have the eagle feeding the babies. Like a, a parent eagle tenderly meeting every need, it says the Lord of hosts hovers over his people and protects us, and he never leaves us or forsakes us. There he is again, hovering, caring for the baby. Like birds hovering overhead, this is another place from Isaiah 31, 5. Like birds hovering overhead, the Lord Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield it and deliver it. He will pass over it and rescue it. But then one day, the mother eagle swoops in and begins to stir up the nest. What would it mean to stir up the nest? And I asked John Gatchett about this, and he said this, this is not characteristic of bald eagles, of which we are the most familiar. So the, it must be Middle Eastern eagles that do this. But what they, they do is they pull out all the soft stuff and leave the pokey sticks in the nest. Why would a parent eagle do that to their kid? I'm yeah, they wanted those kids to be standing up and flapping and kind of maneuvering their way around instead of cuddling in all soft and cozy, right? Um, and, and that the eagle does this. This forces the eaglets to balance themselves and hang on. The alternative is not an option. They have to get going. So life is no longer predictable. But I want to just tell you this, and I want you to think about it. When God stirs your nest, he's getting you prepared to fly. 
okay? So when you have a comfort, a creature comfort removed from you, it's because God has a next step, something he wants you to learn, something more for your life that he wants for you. All right? So how has God been stirring your nest? You have some new challenges to face? And it's funny because when you hit your later years, they're not professional challenges. They're challenges of health. They're challenges of relationships. Are you wondering why a loving father could do such a thing as remove a comfort? It's because, as we said in Sabbath school, he is preparing, he wants to form us into the image of his son. And we can't grow when we're comfy cozy all the time. We have to sometimes face some hard stuff to grow like that. But he is just as attentive and just as purposeful when he removes the padding as when it's soft and comfy and his wings are over you. We still need to trust him and abide in his shadow. He knows what he's doing. He's still right there. So. That's the promise. My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And maybe our needs are some of those discomforts. The second verb is hover. When a baby eagle fledges, which is when it lose, loses its baby down and grows flying feathers, the parent actually comes over the nest and flaps his wings. Soon, the food is no longer shredded and brought to the eaglet's beak, but it's dropped a little further away, still in the nest, encouraging the eaglet to move about and develop shredding skills. For short periods of time, the eaglet is left alone, but the parent is never far off. As the eaglets move around the empty nest, the process of strengthening their wings begins. Parent eagles then flutter over the nest often with the food just out of reach. In doing so, it demonstrates to the eaglets that their wings work too, and also compels those eaglets to flap those side appendages to grasp the food. As the fledgling stretches for food, it mimics the parents, and it flaps the newly feathered wings. The subsequent wind that the parents' wings make actually lifts those babies up just a little tiny bit. And they get to have their very first flying lessons right within their nest. And their parent is providing the updraft. How cool is that? Yeah, that, that God knew that these eagles, and that's what God does for us. He sometimes creates a little bit of turbulence to provide that little bit of updraft that will teach us to use our wings too. The little eaglets are also very hungry. And eventually, and, the, and John Gatchett disagreed with this, he says the parents never let those babies go hungry because they need all the strength that they can have. Okay? But the person I I'm doing my research from said they come less frequently, frequently because the parents use the food as a motivation to get out of the nest. Bewildered, frustrated, and confused, the eaglet moves, branches out of the nest, and begins to test her own wings out of desperation. The parents wisely know that without this disruptive environment, their young will not grow, learn, and develop the skill of flying, which is essential. Though the eaglet does not understand it at the time, the lack of food and removal of comfort is an act of tender care and love. The parents are giving her the gift of life, the gift of flight. So faith for us is like flight for the eagle. It's essential for us to survive and thrive. Sometimes we feel like an eaglet, striving, flapping, fledging, and yet as we flap, can you imagine, forage and fledge, God gives us the strength we need. Much like the eaglet bewildered by her parents, or we can be bewildered by our fathers 
attention or lack of attention or action in our life or lack thereof. Sometimes I literally pray this prayer, God, why don't you do something? All right? And as my faith grows, I pray that less often. I pray, Lord, give me patience and faith to wait for your perfect time instead of do something, God. We may even feel that our Father has forgotten us, abandoned us, or withheld good for us. Okay, and eventually the fledgling looks over the edge of the nest, and they are afraid. Now, if you were that high up, would you be afraid of that first flight? <laughs> Frances Hammerstrom spent her life studying eagles, and made this observation of the fledgling's first flight in her book, An Eagle in the Sky. The eaglet is now alone in the nest. Each time the parent came flying toward the nest, the eaglet called for food eagerly. But over and over again, the parent came with empty feet, and the eaglet grew thinner. He pulled meat scraps from an old dried-up carcass lying in the nest. Days passed. He lost body fat. He became quicker in his movement. And from time to time, he was airborne for a moment or two. The parents often flew fast and sometimes fed him. Beating his wings and teetering on the edge of the nest, he screamed for food every time they flew by. And the parent then flew past just out of reach, carrying delectable meals, a half-grown jackrabbit or a plump rat. Although he was hungry most of the time, he was becoming more playful as he lost his baby fat. And sometimes... When no parent was in sight, he pounced ferociously on a scrap of prairie dog skin or old bits of dried bone. And I found that God does this for me. When he wants me to move to the next thing, he makes me um, have divine discontent with where I'm at. And divine discontent is not bad. It's when God is saying, where you're at and what you're doing is not my final stop for you. There's something yet I have for you to do or to do or, or to be or to grow. So I'm finding that for me, it's not that I'm, I have discontent with my work. I have discontent with the world. I am so tired of seeing what's happening in the world. The pandemic and all the death and the hunger. I'm so overwhelmed with the hunger that is happening and will be happening in the upcoming year and with the war in Ukraine. It's taken the comfort of saying everything is hunky-dory away from my life. I feel like we're in a crisis and that the end of the world is near. This has left me hungry for something more. I am waiting for help from an outside source. I am waiting for God to come and deliver his people from planet Earth. I believe with my whole heart that God has been stirring my nest to create a greater longing in my heart for the world made new, for heaven, when his justice is over all the earth and his kingdom is restored. He could come any day. <clears throat> I don't just have this belief because of my current situation. I believe the Bible tells us to believe that, to think that he's coming soon. But let's go back to the eaglets. A parent flew by downwind, dangling a young marmot in its feet. The eaglet almost lost its balance with the eagerness for food. Then the parent swung by again, closer, upwind, and riding the updraft by the eerie as though daring him to fly. Lifted light by the wind, suddenly the eaglet was airborne, flying, or more like lighting for the first time in his life. He sailed across the valley to make a scrambling, almost tumbling landing on a bare knoll. He turned to get his bearings, and the parent dropped the young marmot nearby, so he had a meal. A little positive reinforcement. Half running, half flying, he pounced on it and ate his fill. Sometimes it's God himself who leads us from the nest 
and lets us go into free fall. As we begin to fall, we have to stretch our wings, and the will to live and the struggle to survive takes over. Well, I'm stuck there. Okay, press the button, Max. It's not going anywhere. I must have run out of battery. <laughs> All right. Our first attempts are clumsy and of sheer panic, but they are necessary. Deuteronomy 31, 32, 11, you're going to have to use your Bibles. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There we go. Like an eagle who stirs up her nest and hovers over her young, who spreads her wings to catch them and carries them on her pinions. It says he stretches his wings to catch them. Now, John doesn't said that he has never seen this, and he's watched a lot of birds a lot of eagles. But again, it might be a different kind of eagle that was in the Middle East. Um, when we are out of our element and too weak or immature to survive on our own, he catches us. What a metaphor. I needed this today. A verse that promises us that when we fall, we can trust our Father to be there to catch us, hold us, and bring us back to safety. V.C. Holgram wrote, Many ornithologists have thought that the Bible picture of an eagle carrying her young was merely figurative. But in recent years, certain reliable observers have actually seen a parent bird let its young rest for a moment on the feathered back, especially when there was no other roosting place in sight. When an eagle's nest is on the ledge of a sheer walled canyon, many feet above the earth with no jutting tree or protruding rock to break the fall, a quick movement of a mother bird to offer her own back to a frightened fledgling may be the only way to let it live to try its wings again. So there's that picture of God just saying, I know you have nowhere to go, so here, land on me. That's what we have is a God that will do that for us. There are other Bible verses that speak of God carrying Israel on its wings. One is here. You yourself have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Or of God renewing our strength, which I think he does that by catching us and letting us rest. And here it says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings as eagles. You all have this memorized, right? They'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not fade. I think we, we renew our strength as we ride, as he soars and we hold on until we can fly again. So Henry Nowen tells a story that explains how important trust is in this process. The Flying Rodleys are trapeze artists who perform in the German circus Simonite Barum. When the circus came to Freiburg two years ago, my friends France and Rainey invited me and my father to see the show. I will never forget how enraptured I became when I first saw the Rodleys move through the air, flying and catching as elegant dancers. The next day, I returned to the circus to see them again and introduced myself as one of their great fans. They invited me to attend their practice sessions, gave me free tickets, and asked me to dinner and suggested that I travel with them for a week in the near future. I did, and we became good friends. One day I was sitting with Rodley, the leader of the troop, in his caravan talking about flying. He said, a fly as a flyer, I must have complete trust in my catcher. The public might think that I am the great star of the trapeze, but the real star is Joe, my catcher. He has to be there for me with split-second precision and grab me out of the air as I come to him in my long jump. How does it work? Henry Alpnow and asked. And here's a picture of the Flying Rodleys. 
The secret, Rodley said, is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, I simply stretch out my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me and pull me safely over the apron beyond, beyond the catch bar. You do nothing, Henry said surprised. Nothing, Rodley repeated. The worst thing a flyer can do is try to catch the catcher. I am not supposed to catch Joe. It's Joe's task to catch me. If I grab Joe's wrists, I might break them, or he might break mine, and that would be the end of both of us. A flyer must fly and a catcher must catch, and the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. When Rodley said this with so much conviction, the words of Jesus flashed through Henry's mind. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Don't be afraid. Remember that you are the beloved child of God. He will be there for you when you make your jump. Don't try to grab him. He will grab you. Just stretch out your arms and hands and trust, trust, trust. So maybe that's what it's all about. Trust can ask you to both tuck yourself under his wings and to take a leap when he tells you to. He will catch you and he will carry you. And when you trust, you will do both intermittently, tuck under or jump. And sometimes you do that at the very same moment. God can catch you. God can carry you. You are never out of his shadow and never beyond his watchful eye. When you are afraid and when you feel like you're in a free fall, know that his wings of protection are not only over you, but they might be under you. Amen. Okay, and I have a song that's a, a YouTube video that I want you to see. It's really amazing. So hopefully they'll get that queued up and... <laughs> 